The following is part of Cornell Contemporary China Initiative Lecture Series under the Cornell East Asia Program. The arguments and viewpoints of this talk belong solely to the speaker. We hope you enjoy. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Cornell Contemporary China Initiative Lecture Series. My name is Mara Du. I teach Qing and Republican China at the Department of History at Cornell. Um, I'm serving as the director of the CCCI series in spring 2023 with the theme in January China. Founded in 2015, this lecture series has brought hundreds of leading scholars on China from various disciplinary backgrounds to share their cutting edge research with Cornell students, faculty, and the general public. This theory, this series is sponsored by the East Asia program. Here, I would love to express my sincere gratitude to our co-sponsors, the Department of Asian Studies, Cornell Center for Social Sciences, the Feminist, Gender, and the Sexuality Studies Program, the Department of History, IRR Schools Global Labor Institute, the Levinson China and Asia Pacific Studies Program, and the Cornell Society for the Humanities. Before we formally start, I want to announce our next EAP event and the next CCCI talk. So next uh, EAP event will be uh, by Professor Yuchiko Okuyama uh, on her new book uh, here uh, on her new book on manka and the memory of mental health in Japan. That would be on Wednesday, March the ninth. No, Thursday. Thursday. Now. Is that okay. improper? Okay. Thursday, March the ninth at four thirty p.m. in person at the same location. Uh, and then our next CCCI event will be on April the 20th by Professor Matthew Summer, who visits from Stanford University to talk about uh, transgender in late imperial China case studies from the Qing archives. Unlike other CCCI events this semester, Professor Summer's CCCI talk will be on the Thursday, April the 20th, and it will be followed by a Cornell Classical Chinese Colloquium on Friday, April the 21st at Rockefeller Hall, 370, uh, 374 at 3.30 p.m. It's a great honor for me to introduce our speaker today, uh, Professor Wang Xian is an assistant professor in the Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures at the University of Notre Dame. Professor Wang received her PhD in East Asian Languages and Cultures from the University of Michigan in 2018. Her research and teaching interests encompass modern Chinese literature, film, popular culture, gender and memory studies. Her current book project, Flesh and Stone, Negotiating Memories of Chinese Female Revolutionary Martyrs examines how contested fictional and historical records, stone monuments, and artistic representations of female martyrdom form the national memory. She just submitted her manuscript, and congratulations. Uh, Professor Wang is also the author of multiple peer-reviewed and public-facing articles, and she is working on two separate book projects, uh, very exciting. So since uh, spring 2022, the CCCI series has been held both in person on campus and broadcasted online via Zoom. For those who are attending the lecture via Zoom today, please type in your comments and questions into the chat box anytime during the lecture or uh, during the Q&A. We will cover them uh, following the, uh, during our Q&A session um, following the lecture. The recording of this lecture will be made available online uh, after the talk. Please feel free to share it with your colleagues, classmates, and friends if they cannot make it today due to schedule conflict. Uh, now let us welcome Professor Wang Xian with warm applause. Thank you. And Professor Wang, the floor is yours. OK, thank you so much. So thank you, uh, Professor Du Yue, for your kind introduction. Uh, also, I want to thank uh, Amala Lane for um, helping me with all the logistics and for making this happen. Um, I'm also grateful for this opportunity to give the talk during the Women's History Month uh, to raise the awareness of uh, comfort women issue. Um, this talk was also inspired by our Cornell uh, East Asian uh, Studies uh, community, which supported uh, the memory project 
back in 2016 to preserve the memory of a great famine in China. So I'm uh, honored to be here at Cornell to join the discussion on gendered violence and how to preserve unspeakable memory. Um, more specifically, I want to uh, talk about how to remember wartime sexual violence and so-called comfort women. So uh, before addressing these questions, I want to give you some background, some context um, for my research on the representations of um, comfort women in Chinese literature and film. Um, so this is a byproduct of my recently finished book manuscript titled Flash and Stone, an imaginary museum for Chinese female revolutionary martyrs. So it is an interdisciplinary project um, on gendered violence and the national memory in modern China. It um, examines um, the commemorations and the uh, narratives of uh, female revolutionary sacrifices in modern China. And it also uh, investigates the shift from female chaste martyrdom to female revolutionary martyrdom. Uh, it considers um, how this kind of uh, advocacy of female martyrdom uh, actually supports or questions state ideologies. So one of the chapters in this book manuscript is uh, uh, centered around uh, a famous uh, Chinese female author, Ding Ning's short story, When I Was in Xia Village. For those of you who are not quite familiar with this short story, Wai was in Xia village, tells the story of this village girl who is abducted by the Japanese army to serve as a sex slave. And then she later works for the Chinese Communist Party as a spy to collect intelligence on Japanese troops. Um, so it's a classic short story we usually include in our modern Chinese literature class or a course on gender politics in modern China. Um, but I always find it's hard for me to explain who Zhen Zhen is to our students. So usually when teaching these short stories, the emphasis is on the controversies surrounding the author Ding Ning, Ding Ning's writings during the Yan'an rectification movement in 1940s and anti rightist movement in the 1950s. Um, so, Zhen Zhen, this uh, female protagonist, is simply referred to as a uh, sex spy or military prostitute. Every time I bring up that Zhen Zhen is actually a comfort woman, a victim of the Japanese military sexual slavery system, most of my students, they haven't heard about this term before. So during World War II, um, hundreds, thousands of um, young women across Asia, um, they actually, um, they were forced to serve as uh, comfort women, so-called comfort women. Um, so I want to first clarify the term uh, a little bit because the term itself is deceiving. Um, so it is a euphemism which refers to who are forced to provide sexual services to Japanese army, uh, specifically during World War II. Um, so uh, it is deceiving because for the victims, uh, there was no comfort but sufferings. Uh, it is doubly deceptive um, given that most of the comfort women, they, they, are, uh, they were not adults but uh, teenage girls or even younger. So I'm only using this term here in my talk uh, because it is still widely recognized as a term which refers to the victim of um, the, the uh, uh, victim of the comfort women system. Um, so starting from uh, my uh, research, um, uh, the short story when I was in Xia Village, I actually found out that there are many other uh, 
literary works on uh, comfort women in Chinese wartime literature from 1930s to 1940s. Um, so, but they are still understudies, understudied, especially uh, in English scholarship. Um, so, and, and additionally, most of the scholarship on comfort women, um, they offered from, provided from a perspective of uh, history, political science, or legal studies, not so much uh, in literary studies, or in literature, especially in uh, Chinese literature. So in today's talk, I want to talk about uh, uh, the literary representations of comfort women from Chinese literature in the 1930s and 40s, uh, as well as uh, two recent uh, documentaries on uh, comfort women survivors in China, focusing on one common uh, motif in these literary works and uh, films, uh, the voices. I want to explore how the individual voices of comfort women can be uh, included in the collective memory and how should we remember wartime sexual violence. Um, so um, I want to start with introducing the first Western style opera in China titled Akiho which actually depicts a Japanese comfort woman in wartime China. So in June 1938, uh, there was a news report published in Kangzhang uh, Wenyi uh, titled, Japanese soldiers in Yangzhou commit suicide. Um, so the, the author uh, reported that um, um, uh, there, there was this 26-year-old uh, Japanese soldier uh, committed suicide by slitting his own throat. On the same night, uh, Akiko, a Japanese girl, committed suicide by hanging herself at a comfort station in Yangzhou. Um, so according to the report, there were many uh, so-called comfort stations full of um, Japanese girls and abducted Chinese girls to fulfill the sexual needs of the Japanese soldiers. So one day, this Japanese soldier uh, went to this comfort station in Yangzhou and found out that uh, uh, his wife, Akiko, is actually the newly recruited comfort woman. Uh, the two committed suicide as a result of um, the feelings of shame. So in 1939, based on multiple, um, multiple reports on tragic death of Akiko and her husband, Chen Ding wrote a play titled Akiko, for which uh, Huang Yuanluo uh, composed the songs. And then uh, uh, Zhang Yuyuan and Li Jia wrote the lyrics. So that was the first Western-style opera ever written and performed in China. So the opera was first performed in China in Chongqing um, by China Experimental Opera Group on January 31st, 1942. It was a huge success. The political leaders and the intellectuals such as Zhou Enlai and Guo Muruo were among the audience and spoke highly of uh, the opera. So it's worth noting that um, uh, in this operatic version of the story, um, Akiko died uh, for protecting her husband rather than committing suicide. And her husband later joined Chinese army to fight against the Japanese. So it delivers very strong anti-war messages. Uh, with Akiko singing on stage, um, actually, this opera presents the voices of Japanese comfort women. Um, and then next, next one, because the popularity of this uh, opera, the script and the music notations of it 
uh, was published in October 1942. Uh, another example um, is that um, uh, in 2014, the Nanjing Art Academy re recovered uh, the music score of the opera and performed it in Nanjing. And then later in 2015, they performed it in Edinburgh to bring the voice of uh, comfort women to the international stage. Another example I want to give in terms of the representations of uh, Japanese comfort women in wartime China is Xie Bingying's short story, uh, the, girl, the Girl Umeko. Um, so um, for us to understand uh, the author Xie Bingying's writing during the wartime, I want to give you some background information. Xie Bingying was one uh, of the a woman who actually passed a rigorous exam to uh, study at the prestigious uh, Huangpu Military Academy in Wuhan in 1926. It was transgressive and controversial for women to join the army at the time. So uh, Xie Bingying was a pioneer. Um, and after finishing her military training in Wuhan, she joined the army on the front lines. And she kept a diary while she was in the army to, uh, uh, about uh, her experience in, in the army. And then the diaries were first published in uh, the supplement to the Central Daily, Zhongyang Rebao Fukan. And they were later translated into English by Lin Yutang. Um, the diary collection was published in 1929 and, and generated heated discussions. Uh, in 1936, uh, she published uh, the autobiography of a female soldier. So the two books they are quite influential in the history of modern Chinese literature, and they also provide first-hand uh, uh, materials about war and um, revolution in China through the eyes of a female soldier. Um, in 1941, Xie Bingying published a short story collection, uh, and the short story, The Girl Umeko, uh, is one uh, of the stories in this collection, also the title of, uh, of the book. So it tells the story about this uh, Japanese girl who travels to China with so-called comfort team, uh, primarily for the reason to find her husband, who is recruited to fight on the front lines in China. And after arriving in Wuhan, uh, Umeko actually uh, finds out that her husband has already died during the war. And then she is forced to serve as a, a, a comfort woman in Wuhan. During her days in Wuhan, she, was, she is abused by Japanese soldiers and, um, and witnesses um, uh, uh, the Japanese soldiers rape Chinese women, bury Chinese men alive kill Chinese ch uh, children. So those atrocities uh, make her to reconsider the meaning of war. So after half a year, she was uh, relocated to Shashi, a city near Wuhan, to continue to be a comfort woman. In Shashi, she develops a romantic relationship with a Japanese pilot and eventually convinces him to, um, uh, to join the Chinese army with her to fight against the Japanese. At the end of the story, uh, the two are assigned by a Chinese uh, general uh, to join the Korean volunteer team, Chao Xian Yi Yong Dui. So it's a, a Korean military uh, unit fighting against the Japanese in China. Um, so it, it was not a coincidence that the author Xie Bingying mentions Korean volunteer team in the story because the Korean volunteer team was established in Wuhan in 1938 
where she had been in got her military training and the fictional Wumeko, fictional character Wumeko uh, became a, a comfort woman. So um, in the same year in 1938, uh, Chinese writer and communist revolutionary, revolutionary Shu Qun, um, he was assigned by Li Keqiong, who was in charge of the CCP's intelligence department, to be the contact person for the Korean uh, volunteer team. So Shu Qun was familiar with um, uh, the Korean community in China at the time. Uh, he actually wrote a short story uh, titled A Child Without a Country, published in 1936. So it's a story about a Korean boy's life in China. Um, it is based on his friendship with a Korean boy um, um, in middle school in uh, northeast China. Um, so later, Shu Qun uh, published a short story series titled The Ballads of Blood. The eighth story in this series uh, is about a Korean comfort woman. So in addition to the literary representations of Japanese comfort women in Chinese wartime literature, there were also uh, the literary representations of Korean comfort women. Um, so the short story is about uh, the Chinese army defeats a Japanese troop and rescues a 16-year-old uh, Korean girl who was forced to serve as a comfort woman. Um, and then the most of the short story is actually devoted to the sound of crying of this Korean girl. Um, so. The, the writer uh, writes, um, it seems that she only has one simple feeling and one way to express her feeling, that is the sound of her crying. Um, so in both a uh, Balance of Blood and A Child Without a Country, Shu Qun actually laments the loss of one's motherland because the Korean girl later explains that she cries because she feels that she will never get a chance to go back to her country again. Um, and then another author, uh, B, published a short story titled Hannibal's Laments uh, in the same year in 1939. It tells a similar story about this Korean girl who is sold to Japan and abused by her Japanese husband. And later she is recruited by the Japanese government to serve as a comfort woman in China. She is rescued by uh, some uh, Chinese soldiers uh, in Shanxi. Um, and then uh, the writer also writes about uh, crying as well. So in this short story, the narrator, I, is a Chinese uh, soldier. Um, uh, so one day, uh, the Chinese soldier asks uh, uh, Hanako about uh, her past when they are drinking together. So uh, it reads, Hanako cried. She leaned over the edge of the table. Her curly hair trembled like a black peony in the wind because of her sadness. Her pitiful sobbing sound made my heart quiver. Suddenly, my tears began to fall into the wine cup. So the two cry together and form a very special friendship during the war time. So in both uh, Hanako's Laments and the Ballads of Blood, um, crying is a reminder of the tragic experience of uh, the comfort woman. Um, the crying also evokes uh, sympathy and delivers strong anti-war messages. Another example of the literary representation of uh, Korean comfort women is Wang Jisoo's classic Chinese poem, uh, The Lament of a Korean Girl, published in 1940. 
So the poem is written for, from the perspective of uh, this Korean girl who was forced to be a comfort woman. So the preface actually to the poem actually gives us some context. So it says, our troops attacked the Japanese army in Xinjiang and captured over 10 enemies. Among them, there were two Korean girls who were rescued by the enemy troop for the conflict unit to go to the front lines to be sexually abused. So in the poem, um, the Korean girl actually describes how she is um, forced to serve as a uh, Comfort woman. So it reads, the magnificent government issued a statement. It says that the front lines need comfort. Civilian girls cannot marry but wait for the imperial army to recruit them. So despite that, um, uh, some uh, Japanese ultra rightists they deny the Japanese government's involvement in the comfort women system. Uh, Wang Jisoo's poem and the later works we discussed earlier demonstrate that uh, the comfort women system was institutionalized. So the later works, historical records, news reports, they speak to each other and form and give us a more complete picture of our wartime memories. For instance, um, Pan Shizhong, uh, this uh, military journalist, published a uh, survey on uh, the military prostitutes of enemy troops in 1944. Um, so uh, it details the lives of uh, comfort women in Tongchong, uh, Minan, Minan province uh, in China. Um, so. Uh, Basically, um, um, in, in that uh, period of time, uh, um, uh, after the defeat of uh, the Japanese army uh, in, uh, in, the uh, in the Battle of Tengchong uh, in China in September 1944, um, uh, the Korean comfort women in Tengchong, they were either uh, forced to commit suicide or uh, executed by the Japanese army. So basically the report details the life of a uh, Korean woman in uh, Tengchong. And Pan Shenzhen's report was later verified by uh, recently found uh, materials and the images. Um, for example, in the year 2000, uh, the Chinese citizen Xiong uh, Weiyuan released the photos of uh, comfort women um, in, in Tengchong. Uh, so Xiong's family actually ran a photography uh, studio in Tengchong back in 1940s. Um, so after the Japanese occupation uh, in Tengchong, Xiong's family fled uh, the city uh, and then the Japanese army converted the photo studio into a comfort station. Um, and then after the defeat of the Japanese army in September 1944, Xiong's family returned back to uh, Tengchong and discovered the photos of um, uh, comfort women. And then in 2017, uh, the Seoul National University uh, Human Rights Center uh, actually released uh, this uh, video clip um, of uh, Korean comfort women in Yunnan province filmed by the U.S. Army in 1944. In 2018, uh, the South Korean uh, researchers, they uh, released uh, this uh, video clip of Japanese Army's massacre of um, Korean comfort women uh, in Tengchong in uh, September uh, 1944, which corresponds to uh, Pan Shizhen's first-hand uh, report uh, during the wartime China. So 
the literary work, including reportage literature, they preserved the voices of comfort women and added to the historical records. Um, so, so far, we mostly discussed the, the literary representations of uh, Japanese and the Korean comfort women in uh, Chinese wartime literature. Um, so the, the major themes include the cruelty of the Japanese army, uh, sympathy for comfort women, and anti-war messages. Um, in contrast, the representations of Chinese comfort women, they are more complicated. They are not only uh, uh, expressing this anti-Japanese invasion messages, but also uh, reflecting on patriarchal society and patriarchal nationalism under which the Chinese comfort women suffered. So for the discussion on the, uh, the representations of Chinese comfort women, I want to go back to uh, Ding Ning's wartime writings. So uh, before publishing when I was in Xia village, Ding Ning wrote another short story on uh, women who suffered from uh, wartime uh, sexual violence titled A New Faith. So it tells the story of this uh, 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 Granny Chen, who um, is raped by Japanese soldiers and witnesses the rape of her granddaughter and the kill of her uh, grandson. So deeply traumatized by her experiences, she starts to offer her voice, um, telling her stories to inspire people to fight against the Japanese. So upon hearing her rallies, two female uh, Chinese uh, Communist Party cadres uh, invite her to join the women's organization to increase her influence in mobilizing the masses. Um, and then the telling is the major thing in this short story. So uh, Granny Chen starts to tell her story uh, to women in her family but she avoids to tell her story in front of her sons uh, because of the feelings of shame. Um, she goes around to tell her neighbors um, about her sufferings, including how she was abused by the Japanese and how they forced a Chinese man to rape her in public. Um, so at the end of the story, um, Granny Chen always shouts to the villagers, you are not going to forget about this, are you? So telling her stories for Granny Chen is a way to resist the forgetting uh, and to form a collective memory in the community. So her telling takes on another dimension after participating in the revolution. Um, and then she travels to neighboring villages to tell her stories and encourage people to go on the front lines. By connecting her personal experiences to national salvation messages, um, Granny Shen rediscovered the meaning of her life and she no longer feels ashamed in front of her sons. The power of telling also appeared in other uh, wartime writings about women who were suffered from the sexual violence from the Japanese army. For instance, Ma Feng's short story, um, Jin Bao's Mother, it's about the Jin Bao's mother, this peasant uh, woman who was forced by uh, a landlord actually to serve as a comfort woman. And after escaping the Japanese army, Jin Bao's mother has no choice but to become a prostitute uh, to be able to raise her uh, child and uh, care for her uh, mother-in-law. She is identified as a woman idler, Nu Liuzi, and she is publicly humiliated by being paraded through village streets. Um, the story is based on the author's experience 
uh, with the land reform in uh, Jingsui region in 1947. So the, the narrator I in this story is a CCP cadre dispatched to this village to oversee land reform. Um, and initially, he dis despises uh, Jinbao's mother. But after hearing about her tragic past, um, this CCP cadre uh, helped her with um, getting, getting her land during the land redistribution and helping her to participate in speaking bitterness campaign, uh, So speaking bitterness uh, during um, the CCP's land reform uh, actually allows peasants to voice out their grievances and condemn landlords. So um, speaking bitterness actually empowers the peasants through telling their stories. So during a speaking bitterness meeting, uh, Jingbao's mother tells her story about how she uh, was forced by the landlord to serve as a comfort woman in the Japanese army. The meeting is depicted very vividly. It reads, Jingbao's mother initially begins talking while crying. Then she passes out from anger. People spray her with cold water. All of a sudden, she acts crazy, springing up with her hair disheveled. She grins and bares her teeth as she jumps on the landlord Liu Weizai's body and bites him. So her pain and shame are alleviated after uh, speaking out about her uh, suffers. So ultimately, in both Jinbao's mother and New Face, telling is instructed by the Chinese Communist Party to form a collective political voice. So the question is, can those sexually abused women um, talk about their sufferings without political interventions? Um, I think another two wartime short stories, they offer examples. In Cao Bing's The Humiliated, uh, this woman worker, Liang A Kai, uh, in a silk factory in uh, Shunde, Guangdong province, she is abducted by the Japanese to serve as a comfort woman. And after escaping uh, the Japanese army, uh, she constantly tells lies about her whereabouts during her experience for the fear of being judged if she tells the truth. So telling lies for her is a way to avoid possible further humiliations. Uh, but this local hooligan uh, who collaborates with the Japanese uh, discovers her secret and her lies are about to be exposed. Um, in addition, her only hope to go back to work has been shattered because the only machine in the silk factory has been sold to the Japanese. So in desperation, um, uh, Liang Akai attempt, attempts to destroy the machine and passes out next to it. So basically, Liang Akai cannot reclaim her dignity or job back without political guidance. In Liu Qing's short story, the woman who was raped, um, Zhao Kuan's wife is kidnapped by the Japanese army. Um, and then after a month, she found out that she was, she was pregnant, but she was not sure if the father is Zhao Kuan or one of the Japanese soldiers who raped her. Um, so after giving birth to uh, a boy, she is abducted by the Japanese soldier again and becomes insane. And then she um, returns back home uh, and killed her child and goes on the streets to tell everyone how she was comforting the imperial army, Wei Lao Huangjun. In contrast to Granny Chen's structured um, uh, speeches with uh, national salvation messages. 
uh, Zhao Guan's wife's repeated tellings of her stories are disorganized and insane without any political leadership. So um, basically, from the literary books we described here, uh, the, uh, uh, the voices of uh, comfort women, they cannot really erase their pain and shame unless, unless they are incorporated into the grand historical narrative of Chinese revolution or, um, uh, or the national salvation. Right? So, um, because this kind of a revolutionary ideology, uh, uh, revolutionary ideology indicates that the loss of uh, chastity is the indication of the weakness of the nation. Um, so, but Ding Ning's short story, while was in Xia Village, challenges this kind of a national salvation narrative by focusing on the wrong woman herself. So Ding Ning's When I Was in Xia Village tells the story about this village girl named Zhen Zhen, who is, whose name actually means chastity. Um, she is abducted by the Japanese uh, to serve as a comfort woman and later uh, works uh, for the Chinese Communist Party as a spy. Um, she endures both physical and the mental sufferings uh, serving as a comfort woman and a spy. She has a venereal disease, and the dominant voices in this short story is um, villagers spreading rumors about her being unchaste. Her only hope is to go to Yan'an, the headquarters of the CCP, uh, for treatment. But the author, Ding Ning, is very ambiguous about the future of Zhen Zhen in Yan'an. This is also the most controversial part of the story. During the uh, anti-rightist movement in 1950s, the author, Ding Ning, was criticized for glorifying uh, the women who were raped by the Japanese in New Faith and in when I was in Xia village. Um, and Zhen Zhen was uh, condemned as a military prostitute uh, who loses her chastity and integrity, Shi Jie. So Zhen Zhen's story is an example of uh, Louise Edwards' concept of uh, crisis femininity, which grants women um, uh, the right to disrupt gender norms uh, for the sake of national salvation. But once the crisis has, has been resolved, then the women who disrupt the gender norms, uh, they cannot be remembered by the nation, or their stories need to re be rewritten to conform to the gender norms. Um, so as, as Ding Ning indicates uh, in the short story, uh, despite making enormous uh, uh, emotional, physical sacrifices to the revolution, Zhen Zhen uh, has little chance to be included in the official narrative of Chinese revolution because she loses her chastity. So this kind of a, um, this kind of a patriarchal nationalism assigns women this impossible task of sacrificing uh, yourself sexually but at the same, same time remain chaste, um, especially after the crisis subsided. Um, so after analyzing all the literary works during the war time, it is clear that the representations of comfort women they are closely related to, um, uh, or their voices of comfort women are closely related to or incorporated into this nationalist uh, framework. But we are, we are actually uh, losing large uh, part of the story if we only remember comfort women within a nationalist framework. Um, so uh, long after the end of the war, 
the victims of the uh, comfort women, they kept uh, silent because of this kind of a cultural and political pressure that stigmatizes uh, raped women as unchaste and view them as the traces of national pain. Um, so in 1991, uh, Kim Ha-sun, a Korean uh, comfort woman uh, survivor, um, broke the silence. And then more individual voices emerged. But um, the, the voices of Chinese comfort women, they are mostly unheard beyond Asia. So for the rest of my talk, I want to focus on two recent uh, Chinese documentaries on comfort women survivors in China. So back in 2012, Guo Ke, a young Chinese director, read a report about Wei Shaolan, a comfort woman survivor in Guangxi province in China, and decided to make a documentary about her. Um, and then um, the, the short documentary 32 actually was released in 2013. Uh, encouraged by a positive response to this short documentary and the emerging awareness of uh, the decreasing number of the comfort women survivors in China, the director decided to make another uh, documentary on 22 comfort women survivors in China in 2014. So the documentary 32 was 22 was actually finished in uh, two, 2015, but not uh, publicly screened uh, until 2017. Uh, because of the financial issues with the distribution and the publicities. The director was inspired by uh, the successful crowdfunding campaign for the production of a Korean film, Spirits Homecoming, in 2016. And then the director initiated the crowdfunding campaign uh, to support the distribution of uh, the documentary 22. So 30,000 people donated to the film within three months. So with the support of, um, of, of, um, of the crowdfunding uh, participants, uh, the documentary was released on August 14th, 2017 the International Memorial Day for Comfort Women. The first day occupancy rate uh, for this film actually surpassed uh, that of another film in the theater at the same time, Wolf Warrior II, which is uh, one of the most popular film, uh, films actually in the history of Chinese film. Um, so, um, at the end of the at the end of the documentary, um, the director actually paid special thanks to the crowdfunding participants by listing all their names on screen. Um, I think this list is very long and powerful. I think it's very powerful to show uh, this collective voice and support for comfort women. This listing all the names of the crowdfunding participants was also inspired by this um, Korean film, Spirits Homecoming. So although my talk today is uh, mostly about uh, Chinese literature and film, I want to say a few words about um, two Korean uh, films, uh, also focusing on uh, the voices of comfort women. One is Spirit's Homecoming, which tells the story of this, uh, how the voices and the spirit of this uh, deceased comfort woman were channeled by uh, a shaman. Uh, and her spirit uh, actually returns back home to reunite with her parents. And then the other one I can speak is a comedy and a drama uh, which is about this Korean comfort women survivor who learns to speak English in order to 
uh, testify at a public hearing for comfort women in the U.S. to bring the voice of comfort women to the international stage. Um, the two films, they are very, very successful in Korea. Um, back to the documentary 32 and 22, they are also very successful in China, raising the awareness of uh, comfort women issues. Um, so the title of the documentaries 32 and 22 refer to the number of comfort women survivors in China at, ta at the time of filming. What's so special about this, the documentaries is that um, they are not concentrating on the nationalist narratives of comfort women or the politics of comfort women, but rather the daily lives of comfort women survivors. So the director adopted uh, this kind of a non-interactive uh, uh, method of filming um, and he, include, he uh, insists on not including any dramas in the, in the films. As you can see, there are a lot of uh, scenery shots from the two documentaries um, of, of the rain, trees, uh, mountains, and the rivers, which slow down the documentary. The director intentionally uh, not including any uh, historical narratives or voiceover in the films. Um, but rather present comfort women's uh, daily lives without questioning or interrupting. So he explains this kind of a restrained approach uh, in an interview, stating that if you consider the comfort women survivors as your grandmas, then you wouldn't be so cruel to continue to ask questions about their traumatic past. So. Um, the director and his team, they are mostly listeners rather than interviewers. Uh, when the comfort women survivors, they don't feel like talking, and then the director switches camera to the scenery shots. After talking about some, um, the, the, the general style and approach of these uh, documentaries, I want to talk um, about the documentaries in detail. So 32 is a documentary about a comfort woman survivor, Wei Shaolan, and her half-Japanese son, Luo Shanxue. So Wei Shaolan was abducted by the Japanese army to serve as a comfort woman in 1944. So after three months, she uh, luckily escaped and returned home and found out that she was pregnant. Um, and her husband accused her, her husband accused her being unchaste. She attempted suicide but was saved by her neighbors. So her story parallels the story uh, of uh, Zhao Kuan's wife in um, The Woman Who Was Raped in that wartime story. So um, later, she gave birth to uh, Luo Shanxue. So Shanxue actually means um, uh, good at studying uh, in Chinese. But ironically, um, Luo Shanxue dropped out of school at a very young age because the discrimination and isolation in school uh, because of uh, his identity. He's still referred to as a Japanese devil um, um, nowadays. So Wei Shaolan is the only comfort woman survivor who publicly acknowledged that her son is half Japanese. Despite the difficult living situation, um, Wei Shaolan's attitude toward uh, suffering and uh, also uh, her optimism about life is inspiring and contagious. Um, she always says that the world is so great. So this is the poster for 32. As you can see, that it's very poetic, like a landscape painting. Um, 
So the majority of the poster depicts the mountains and the rivers in uh, Guangxi province where Wei Shaolan lives. The poster features a quote from Wei Shaolan, which says, the world is really great. Keep living to see it, even if it means eating only wild vegetables. Um, so next, I want to briefly talk about the documentary 22, which focuses on 22 comfort women survivors in China. I want to briefly talk about two of them. The first one is Lin Lan from Hainan province. She uh, joined a Chinese communist troop when she was 15 years old. And then she was abducted by the Japanese army uh, to be a comfort woman when she was 17 years old. While she was in the army, she um, stole ammunition for the Chinese communist troops. So she was a, a communist revolutionary like Zhen Zhen Ying I was in, in when I was in Xia village. In uh, 2005, um, the Chinese government uh, honored her with a memorial badge commemorating the um, the 60th uh, anniversary of uh, the victory of anti-Japanese war. So her contribution to the revolution was finally recognized. And then the other one is Mao Yingmei, who was originally from Korea. She was deceived into coming to China, believing she would work in a sock factory but she ended up being forced to be a comfort woman in Wuhan. So her stories share a lot of similarities with um, uh, Xie Bingying's short story, The Girl Wumeko. So the Wumeko also works as a comfort woman in uh, Wuhan. Um, and then uh, after the end of the war, uh, Mao Yingmei uh, uh, moved to Xiaogan, a city near Wuhan, and changed her Korean name into a Chinese name with uh, the surname Mao uh, out of the respect for Mao Zedong. What strikes me the most is that she can speak multiple dialects and uh, languages. She mainly speaks uh, Hubei dialect, and she can also speak a little bit uh, Japanese she learned when she was in a comfort station. And she can also remember and sing Korean folk songs from her childhood. Childhood and girlhood are two major themes uh, commemorating comfort women to preserve the images of innocent youth and to condemn the cruelty of the comfort women system. For instance, this is a famous uh, statue commemorating comfort women, the Statue of Peace, established in Korea in 2011. It evokes the youth of uh, comfort women. In 2016, uh, a, a comfort woman a memorial statue um, um, with a Chinese girl and a Korean girl was established at Shanghai Normal University alongside with the opening of the Chinese uh, Comfort Women Museum. Um, and then uh, this poster for 22 uses a very similar concept, depicting uh, a, a girl drawing the face of a comfort woman as a girl. Um, so the poster remembers comfort women as girls, young girls, innocent young girls, while depicting the passing down of the memory of comfort women to the next generation. I think the documentaries 22 uh, and 32 that are significant in passing down the memories of comfort women to the next generation. Um, the stories in the documentaries they echo uh, a lot of uh, wartime writings in 1930s and 40s in China. And they preserve the uh, primary materials for us to remember comfort women, um, their joys and sufferings. They recorded the voices of uh, comfort women with respect and dignity. Um, 
I think the most moving presentation of the voices of comfort women survivors in the documentaries is singing. So singing brings women the joy and transports them back to their childhood or girlhood, a time before the horrors of war. So I want to end my talk with having all of us listening to Wei Shaolan and um, uh, Mao Yingmei singing. あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ
kinjan maman ho ho jo modin tan inalai yo nigang na nu me shin mo ga mo na ja shi jin na na an ve yo pin wu ji mo na yu de ku wa re phong ที่ร่างลุยลุยออกหาดูเกียร์ดีแล้วดูเกียร์ผ่าดูเกียร์เธอดูเกียร์ไก่ดูเลยว่าอินเดียดูมาไก่ไอ้สิกาจินฮอก